aggregate planning is an important function in the management of all operations. It has to do with balancing the capacity or the productive capacity of the organization with the demand for that capacity. So if you are a manufacturing facility, uh, you need to have productive capacity, you need to balance between demand and capacity. If you are a service organization, a restaurant for example, an airline, you have demand for service and you have to be able to provide the capacity necessary to do so. Now aggregate planning uh, typically looks at a medium term planning horizon, so six months to 18 months and so forth. And when we look at a planning horizon that long, we tend to look at um, things in an aggregate sense. And by an aggregate sense, what we mean is that we try to reduce the level of detail. So if you are producing, uh, say, um, uh, an item such as computers, the computers can come in various configurations, but rather than trying to plan 18 months of production for all the various configurations, we may very well look at aggregate products such as laptops, desktops, um, you know, um, tablets, and so forth, and we would group them into these aggregated categories and then do the planning in that fashion. Uh, so aggregate planning is, dif is different from detailed planning in the sense that its planning horizon tends to be medium term and we tend to look at the products that we're trying to produce or the service that we're trying to deliver in an aggregate sense. That means that we would sort of combine the various product uh, categories or we'll create aggregated categories, sorry, which helps to reduce the level of detail and helps to improve the sort of planning accuracy. So what we'll try to accomplish is what do we mean by aggregate planning? Um, what are some strategies that we could use in developing an aggregate plan? Um, in some cases, we will look at the use of a graphical method for aggregate planning. And then we will talk a bit about this concept of yield management, which is extremely important in environments where we have highly uncertain demand and uh, we have a very perishable asset that we're trying to sell uh, in a very short period of time. <coughs> so what is aggregate planning? Aggregate planning, the objective behind it is to sort of meet your demand for service by balancing that demand of capacity at the same time trying to minimize the cost of doing so over the planning period. And that, in a nutshell, is uh, what it's all about. So typically what you would do is you'd have to look at your productive capabilities, you'd have to look at the demand for your different products, and then try to figure out how you can meet the demand through a number of capacity options. All right? So we need to understand what the capacity options are, we need to have a forecast of the demand, and then we need to understand the cost drivers so that we could create a strategy, a capacity strategy, that minimizes our costs over that planning period. So the planning process involves the following steps. Essentially, we need to determine the quantity and the timing of production for the intermediate future, six months, 12 months, 18 months, and so forth. And we try to minimize the costs, and the costs are typically driven by things like production, um, labor, inventory, overtime, the use of subcontracting, and other controllable variables. Now, if we look at uh, these elements right there, those are productive capabilities. Your production rates determine your production, um, has an influence on your productive capacity. Your labor levels, if you have more staff, you have more capacity. Inventory is a form of capacity. You could use overtime as a form of capacity. You could subcontract work. Uh, to a contract manufacturer that is also part of um, capacity. Okay, so all of these things, but they have a cost associated with them. So we need to be able to generate a plan, and that plan requires some information. One is what we call a logical overall unit of measuring sales and output, and that's that aggregated unit that we're talking about. So if we say uh, laptops, 
we're not going to distinguish between the different sizes a 13 inch and a 15 inch and a 17 inch uh, laptop we're not going to distinguish at this point necessarily between the speeds and so forth so we'll aggregate it and figure out what the demands are for laptops and then plan for that a uh, forecast of the demand for an intermediate planning period in these aggregate terms and so <coughs> what are we talking about six months 18 months, 12 months, and so forth. Uh, method for calculating the costs. Because you're talking about an aggregate product, we have to be able to determine the cost associated with that aggregate product. And a model that combines forecasts and costs so that the scheduling decisions can be made for the planning period. So we need a way to actually bring those together so that we could do this. Let's just look at the planning horizon so you see where aggregate planning falls. Uh, long top executives often deal with really long-range plans or strategic plans, uh, major capital decisions such as new products, capital investment, facility locations, and so on. Process choices. Operations managers look at some of the intermediate range plans: is three to eighteen months, sales planning, production planning, and budgeting, uh, employee levels, and so on. And then you see the operations managers, supervisors, and foremen, or four persons. Um, they tend to look at some of the short-range plans that look up to three months. You know, job assignments, scheduling, dispatching, the use of overtime, part-time help, and those sorts of things. So, aggregate plan is in the middle of those things. And this is just it gives you an example of a picture. Here are some products that a company is making. But um, and those products are quite similar. They may use common parts. They have similar demand patterns and so on. And so we see here demand forecast 150 units, but it doesn't say 150 units of which of those. It just means that those six products are, con are aggregated. And we might call them agricultural um, engines, agricultural vehicles, or whatever it is. But they typically are used in an agricultural setting. And we may even be able to group this into two categories. Um, uh, it all depends on, on what their functions are. All right? Again, just to put aggregate planning into perspective, a uh, company may make some product decisions which are long term and strategic in nature. Uh, may do some pr process planning so that you, know, you have certain capabilities uh, in terms of your processes. Remember, we talked about. Um, um, <coughs> intermittent versus process oriented versus uh, product oriented types of processes. And then here it is where the aggregate plan comes in where you're trying to forecast your demand over the next uh, and over the intermediate planning horizon for these different products. That comes together to create this aggregate plan which then feeds what we call a master production schedule and uh, an MRP system which is a material requirements planning system. And then detailed work schedules are created for production and so forth. But the aggregate plan, as you can see, is a, a very important um, part of that entire planning process, right in the middle of all of this. Okay. So the process, as we mentioned, combines resources in general terms. It's part of a larger production planning system. And this aggregation at a later stage tends to take the aggregate decisions that you make and break them down. So for example, if you decided how many laptops to produce in a given period, then you now need to break that down into what percentage of that in that over the short period would be 13 inches versus uh, 15 inch uh, screens versus 17 inch screens. Uh, that would be the more dis uh, detailed or disaggregated production plan in this case. And the disaggregation results in what we call a massive production schedule because now you need to um, schedule specific resources to produce each of the items that constitute the aggregate product, okay? <coughs> so what are some strategies? Remember what we're trying to do is to balance between capacity and demand. And we could try to meet the demand through a number of different strategies. So one of the things we could do is to use um, inventories to absorb changes in demand. So you may decide to keep a sort of a level production rate and then stock up inventory in periods of low demand and use that to satisfy uh, demand when you have cases where the demand actually exceeds the average production level. 
So in other words, you when you have idle capacity, you use it to uh, create stock. And then you use that for periods where your demand seems to be exceeding your capacity. And that's when we reduce inventories. You could actually accommodate some changes by varying the workforce size because the workforce will have builds capacity. And so you could decide to hire people or lay them off. If uh, the demand is low, that's what some companies do. Unfortunately, they have to lay off some workers. Use part-time workers uh, where you could bring them in um, on an as-needed basis. Or you could use overtime or idle time. You could say, well, here's what. We won't lay off anyone, but our current demand is not sufficient for our capacity level. So we'll use idle time or under time. And then you could use subcontractors. If uh, rather than using overtime, you might decide there's a subcontractor that could do this cheaper than using them paying time and a half or time and three quarter, whatever it is, or double time. And then you could use some price changes to influence the demand side of things. So some of the things we talked about were capacity oriented, but on the demand side, you could actually try to influence the demand by doing things such as um, using pricing strategies or scheduling uh, strategies or using certain policies around minimum order quantities and so forth. All right? So let's look at the capacity options. We said um, we could change inventory levels. So increase the inventory in low demand periods to meet high demand in the future. Increase, um, increases costs associated with storage because now you're producing more. There's insurance handling obsolescence and capital investment. And sometimes uh, we have to think about the fact that shortages can mean loss of sales due to long lead times and poor customer service. Um, if you don't have enough inventory, certainly you could uh, incur those situations. Uh, in terms of um, varying the workforce size by hiring a layoffs, match the production to the demand rate, meaning that, that it gives you an opportunity to hire just enough people so that your production rate could be, could meet your demand. When your demand drops, you could lay off some people. So it's a, a strategy that you could use to actually match production uh, to demand. But then you have to then have a labor pool available to you that when you need more workers, you could get them. So in small towns where there aren't too many different jobs associated, certain plants, like fish plants, for example, in small villages can certainly do that because um, when there is a lot of fish, there are workers uh, to be hired. When there's not a lot of fish, then they could send them home. And most of these workers are typically at home waiting for a, a call for when things are, are better. Um, and then, of course, you want to make sure that it's not an environment that, is, that you require highly skilled workers. So training costs is not that expensive or laying off costs is not that expensive either. So, um, but you have to keep in mind a couple of things. One is that you have training and separation costs involved. Um, new workers may have lower productivity levels than you know, if you're bringing on new people all the time. And then of course, when, if you keep laying off workers, it could have a negative effect on the morale of the employees. <coughs> you could also vary uh, your production rate through overtime or idle time, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you could keep a constant workforce and then simply just decide how many hours you're going to let them work. Um, if you have large increases in demand, then you're going to have to use overtime, and sometimes that could be quite expensive. All right? Subcontracting, a temporary measure. So you have to be able to, you have to have a product that for which you have a number of potential subcontractors who could do it. Uh, temporary measure during periods of peak demand may be costly. Assuring quality and timely delivery may be difficult. It all depends on your relationship with your subcontractor and exposes your customers to a possible competitor. All right? uh, Part-time workers useful for filling unskilled or low skilled positions, especially in services. So at uh, Christmas time, the use of part-time workers is a very common thing. On the demand side, you could um, try to influence demand by using advertising or promotion, low periods. You could attempt to shift uh, demand uh, to low periods. The whole reason why uh, you have cheap night in terms of movies on Tuesday nights, uh, typically Tuesday night is not a very high demand uh, period. So by offering a, a price discount, a lot of people, you move the demand perhaps off the weekend uh, towards Tuesday. and um, and so people say, well, this movie is coming out. It's just been released on the weekend. Uh, I'm going to wait till Tuesday to see it. So some of the demand for the service on the weekend 
is actually move now to the cheaper period. Some people who are price conscious will take advantage of that, advantage of that opportunity. All right. Um, sometimes these pricing options may not necessarily be sufficient to balance the demand and capacity um, in a case like that. Back ordering is sometimes useful. If customers are willing to wait for a product, if you are the only supplier, then back ordering is a, can be a good strategy. Uh, back ordering during high demand periods requires customers to wait for an order without loss of goodwill or the, or the order. Most effective when there are few, if any, substitutes for the product. If there are substitutes, more than likely you will lose that customer and can result in lost sales if there are options available. All right. On the demand options, um, you have counter seasonal product and service mixing. So in the winter, you, you know, just before winter, you make some snow blowers. Just before summer, you shift your capacity and make some mowers, grass mowers, of course. And so then that way you're able to use your capacity effectively. So develop a product mix of counter seasonal items so that way you don't, you don't find yourself with idle capacity in one season and not enough capacity in another. May lead to products or services outside the company's area of expertise, um, so that depends. Uh, in the case of the lawnmowers and snowblowers, these are sort of similar competencies, so you might very well be able to um, have both of those existing within a single company. Are we planning options? So what can we do? We talked about changing inventory levels, being the workforce size, and then there are advantages and disadvantages, of course, with all of those options. And um, we've sort of uh, briefly alluded to some of those already, being production rates, subcontracting, use of part-time workers, influence and demand, and so forth. So this is a fairly nice summary uh, of all of the potential options that we can use. So what are some strategies and some methods for aggregate planning, uh, particularly in a production environment? Uh, we have a couple of different strategies. Um, we have what we call some sort of pure strategies and then we have some mixed strategies. Uh, so a pure strategy would be an example where we would simply say, let us just keep a fixed production rate or let us um, keep a fixed number of workers or let us chase the demand. But a mixed strategy is a combination of all of those and in, in a lot of cases, um, the mixed strategy might be the best way to achieve minimum cost. Right? Finding the optimal plan is usually not always easy and one may not necessarily exist depending on the conditions that you're placing on the planning process. So let's talk about a couple of different approaches to aggregate planning where we're trying to match capacity with demand. One is called a chase strategy. That means that you, if, you, if you've identified the forecast, then you vary your workforce to actually meet your uh, demand. And the idea is that um, you could sort of figure out just exactly how many workers are necessary to meet that demand. And um, of course, you, what you happen is you minimize inventory related costs because it's a chase strategy. You're chasing the demand. But the problem, of course, is that you're going to have to, if you vary the workforce size, you're going to be considering costs associated with hiring and layoffs. And um, that could be very tricky. Uh, again, it all depends on your environment. If you have a highly unionized environment, it might be difficult. If you have an environment where people have other options when it comes to um, jobs, then you may not get these workers back when you need them. Right? An another one is called a level strategy. In level strategy, we say, okay, um, rather than following the um, rather than following the demand pattern and incurring no inventory costs, we will have a steady production rate that allows us to meet the total annual requirements. But what happens is that there are some periods where we will carry inventory and there are some periods where we will have some shortages. So you will incur inventory uh, and back order related costs. So you use inventory or idle time as a buffer um, stable production leads to better quality and productivity uh, and some combination of capacity options. A mixed strategy might be the best solution still. However, um, the level strategy al allows things to be fairly stable. But remember now, with that level strategy, it's possible to have periods where you have back orders and then periods where you're carrying excess inventory. But ultimately, you want to make sure 
that the cost of that strategy is, uh, is fairly reasonable. How do we do aggregate planning? Um, you could do it sort of, depending on the complexity of the problem, you could use some simple graphical tools, but really and truly, there are mathematical models that can be used to actually solve those problems. And that will be demonstrated uh, in a separate video. Let's just look at the graphical models uh, quickly. So what you would do is you determine the demand for each period, determine the capacity for regular time, over time, subcontracting, and so forth. What are your labor costs, hiring costs, layoff costs, production costs, inventory costs, back order costs, get all the cost information uh, that's necessary. And a company has to have some sort of policy on its workers. Maybe it may not want to hire more than so many people at a time or lay off more than so many people at a time. It may want to limit the amount of um, under time it uses or over time it uses. All of those constraints can be, or uh, uh, policies can be incorporated into the model. Of course, it makes it more complex the more policies that you actually include. So here's uh, what uh, an example looks like. Here's a company that's doing some roofing. It has demand for service. And um, we have, these are the forecasted demand in units. And then production days available. So different months may have different levels of production days. Uh, in some cases, you might have a shutdown. As you can see, February is a shorter month. And then based on, on that, we could actually figure out what's our demand per day. You could compute 900 divided by 22 and sort of round that up uh, a little bit. And so we see here, in this example, the lowest um, demand per day uh, is like 38, maximum is 68, and it's always good to draw the profile of um, what capacity you have available with what the demand distribution actually looks like. All right. So here's an example, this is the profile of the forecasted demand right here. So we could see here the demand is fairly low and then all of a sudden it gets very high. Okay. So depending on how we establish things like our production rates and so on, we could, you know, we could sort of eyeball, if you wish, um, certain production rates that kind of map or match um, or, or that brings us, you know, according to what our policies are, we could sort of decide what the appropriate uh, production strategy is. All right. So here's a case where if we were to use a level production, we could determine across all of the demand that we need an average production rate of 50 units per day. So what happens is that if we average of 50 units per day, as you can see, in this section, in this section, we would be incurring inventory because our production rate is higher than our demand. Now in this section here, where our demand is higher than production, you would hope that the inventory that we accumulated in these periods will offset this um, excess demand right here. And that's really what you're trying to balance. And depending on where this line is positioned, of course, you will get different cost implications all right, for um, the different strategies. So we're going to look at a couple of um, strategies. One, plan number one, a constant workforce. And then here's all of our cost information. The unit carrying cost is $5 per month, subcontracting $20 per unit, average period $10 per hour, overtime is 17 above 8 hours, uh, labor to produce a unit is uh, 1.6 hours per unit, the cost of increasing daily production rate by one unit is 300 involves some hiring and training costs, and then 600 to lay off individuals if you want to change that. And we could use that information in assessing our different strategies. Okay, so in the case of the constant workforce, um, we could sort of uh, figure out how many people we need to have, um, and then we just keep that constant. So in this case, uh, we're going to keep a workforce that allows us to produce 50 units per day, and that doesn't change. And so at producing 50 units per day, here's what our production quantities would be, but here's our demand. And so we could see in the first period in January, we have inventory because we have more production than we have demand. And so there's 200 units. And then we could sort of compute that all the way through until we get down to zero. So we could show what our inventory is. There's 400 units here, 
650 and then of course that 150 is actually decreasing at 650 by 150 which brings it down to 500 then that 400 under production here is going to be satisfied from this 500 units available to us so we have 100 left and that 100 units under production will take care of this 100 units and in the end the demand balances out with the capacity but if we look at the end in inventory positions across there it was all positive so we carried inventory so we carried 1850 units of inventory when we multiply that by five dollars per unit to get a sense of what our inventory related costs are so now with a constant workforce we could compute what this particular strategy uh, is costing us all right and it turns out that we end up carrying this much in inventory, 9,250. The regular labor hours, 10 workers times their pay rates and so on, it's $108,450 is what the cost of this plan is. Let's take a look at another, another uh, example. But just before we do that, if we were to draw the cumulative production and the cumulative demand, this is how the two things actually stack up and you can see in this space right here which was when we had excess inventory and then as we started to reduce the inventory down towards the towards zero so our cumulative production became equal to our cumulative demand <coughs> so in this case we want to keep um, the we want to do some subcontracting what we will do is determine the minimum production level that we will do we keep internally and anything over and above that we will go into subcontracting. So we calculated what is our daily demand and then the lowest level was 30, uh, 38. And we don't have to actually keep it 30. We could say let's use a, a level of 40 internally and then, and then subcontract whatever, whatever that's extra. All right? But for now, what we did was we decided to keep the um, minimum production level across. And anything extra, we will actually subcontract. OK, so here's our forecasted demand. Here's our production rate that's based on the lowest level of 38. And maybe anything over and above that. Now, you know that there's some impracticality with the strategy because if the um, demand is start up to 39, you may not subcontract one unit. A subcontractor might say to you, you know, I need a minimum quantity of five units for me to engage you. So in this case, you would then need to set your, uh, your production level to a point where the amounts that you will subcontract will exceed the minimum quantity that a subcontractor wants, all right? But for now, for the exercise, we could subcontract a minimum of one unit uh, in, in our example. So the cost information is pretty much the same and we see here that we produce uh, 4,712 units internally but some contracted uh, 6,000 uh, sorry the difference between the total demand and the amount we produce internally which is 1,488 units that was actually subcontracted and in the end we have a total cost of $105,152, which is cheaper than the sort of constant workforce example that we did earlier. All right? And again, we could always draw the graph to show the cumulative demand versus the cumulative um, capacity. However, because we subcontracted whatever we needed, uh, essentially that strategy matched the demand to capacity, except that. Uh, the capacity was made up of internal plus subcontracted capacity. In uh, this case now, we're actually going to vary the workforce. So we won't incur, uh, we will not incur um, inventory related costs, but then we will incur the costs associated with hiring and laying off of workers. So we will start with an initial um, quantity 41, okay? because this is our daily demand. And then, for example, to get down to 39, we'd have to lay off some people, get down to 38, lay off some people. But to get back to a production, uh, a rate of 57, we're going to have to hire, 68 higher, and then we're going to have to lay off people as well. I don't know if um, our an operations manager would really like to have to be hiring and firing people uh, that often. Certainly, I wouldn't want to. 
and um, it may not necessarily be a nice uh, strategy, but let's look at what happens in the end. So with that example, same cost information, we just need to look at what happens to the schedule. And so you could see here we start off with 41. To get down to 39, we had to do two layoffs. 38, one layoff. And then we have 19 hires from 38. So you just laid off somebody, and then you got to turn around and rehire them, which is no good. And then we have 11 hires, and then now 13 fires. When we put that all together, we have a total cost of 117800 as you could see, when we put the three plants together, only one of them carried inventory, but um, the worst is the one that involves hiring and firing, um, the best is the one that actually used, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, use subcontracting, okay? And it's, like I said, it's not always totally clear which strategy will actually yield the best. And this is where optimization actually can be quite useful. In services, things are a little. When it comes to production environments, for example, you know you could you could determine what the production rate is for a unit and figure out what capacity is required, and then how many units each worker can produce. It's 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 a lot more concrete. In services, it's a lot more difficult. What you do is you estimate labor hours. Then you think at Christmas time, how many labor hours do you really need? How do you measure that? How do you decide um, if you need 10 workers or 8 workers or 6 workers? It is not trivial um, because it's harder to attach the employee output or, or measure employee output in an environment like that. So anyway, um, labor costs tend to be a critical component. So you have to do some accurate scheduling of labor hours to ensure quick response to customer demand. And again, what do you mean by quick response? On call labor resource to cover unexpected demand. So in some cases, if you have higher than la um, larger than um, usual volumes of demand, then you could probably call on your labor pool because you know it's a holiday weekend coming up, so you could call on your uh, part-time or on-call labor. Uh, flexibility of individual worker skills. So you want workers in multiple skills so that you can move them around within the organization. If there's a uh, an area where the demand is low but an area where the demand is high, cross-train workers can Fill, um, can sort of take up the slack in that area. And the flexibility in the rate of output or hours of workers typically happen. Some workers are working five hours uh, for the day, some are working a full eight hour day, some are working, you know, limited amounts of, um, you know, time and so on. So you got to have some flexibility. Not everybody works eight hours because you want to be able to match your capacity to your demand. Okay, so we have number of different scenarios. You can think of restaurants where um, you want to kind of smooth production in the back end, in the kitchen. And um, so that's one of the requirements that you want to consider. Uh, and uh, so one of the things that uh, restaurants tend to do is they do a lot of prep work ahead of time in a slow period so that when the, the customers or the patrons come in, they're not preparing everything from scratch so that they find themselves caught and not being able to deliver the meals on time. So they've got to be able to have a nice smooth production rate where people are waiting an average of, what, five to ten minutes for their meals and not overly lengthy periods because all the work is being done from scratch. Now they need to determine the optimal workforce size, and again, that depends on the volume, the demand for service, how many customers are in that restaurant. In hospitals, we are focusing on responding to patient needs and so on. So how many nurses are on staff at, at a given point in time? Well, it all depends on the current level of demand for service. How many people are actually in the hospital at a given point in time? If, um, if you have a 100-bed hospital and it's only 50% occupancy, the number of nurses that you need or staffing that you need would be different from if you were at 80 or 90% capacity. All right? Um, we have national chains of uh, small service firms. In that case, you could have some aggregate planning that is done at a national level. And then you may have some miscellaneous types of services that um, there's a need to plan the human resource requirements or try to find ways to manage the demand uh, for that service. Uh, in the airline industry, you have a highly complex environment. You have flight, ground crews, passengers, um, allocation of seats to different fare classes and so on. So the resources 
occur in different parts of the system and trying to coordinate that can be quite difficult. The pilots, the crews, um, ground crews, all of these things. So this is a very complicated environment in terms of managing operations. So ground operations for airlines typically are quite complex. All right? We want to talk lastly about this area which has to do with revenue management but is, a, is driven by that relationship between demand and capacity. What you have is a perishable asset, an asset uh, such as a hotel room, something that you want to sell uh, and at the end of the night if that room is not sold you cannot inventory it for the next period. Uh, same thing with airline seats, same thing with car rental companies and so on. So these companies focus on how they could actually influence the demand for their products uh, so that they do not have at the end of the day, at the end of the period, that that product is not sold. So allocating resources to customers at prices that will maximize yield or revenue is what um, yield management is all about. So it happens in both um, service and product environments. So the service or the product can be sold in advance of consumption. The demand fluctuates. Capacity is relatively fixed. So a plane has um, 120 seats, that's it. Uh, a hotel has 200 rooms, that's it. Um, just name it. A car company has uh, a fleet of 50 cars, and that's it. So uh, the capacity is relatively fixed. Demand can be segmented. So those are the people who want hiring cars, the people who want uh, economy, compact, um, they want in, uh, standard SUV, intermediate SUV, full size, they want sports cars, these are all different market segments. Um, variable costs are low, but the fixed costs are very high. So if you think of a, of a hotel, high fixed costs. If you think of a plane, high fixed costs. If you think of, uh, and you have to be able to recoup some of that, that cost. And then, of course, if you think about hospitals, high fixed costs, all of them. So what companies do is they experiment with these prices, and they call them price fencing, or price fences. And the price fences are such that you have to understand the relationship between customer demand and the price. What happens when you change the price? And here's an example of a simple demand curve, which basically shows a straight line. The cheaper it is, the more people will buy it, and then as you get very expensive, then you have less and less buyers. But we know that curves are not always a nice straight line like this. But this is just to illustrate an example. And the variable cost for the room is $15, so therefore you want a price above $15, all right? And once you set the price, you have a sense of what the demand is going to be at a given price. So here's a case where the um, room for the hotel is actually priced at $150. When you price at $150, it turns out that 50 people would actually purchase this um, a hotel room. And we have to look at what happens, uh, these um, yellow areas. What happened is that you have a, a group of people here that you passed up contribution. In other words, they're not quite willing to pay $150, bucks, but they might have paid $75. Right? They might have paid 60 So how could you have set a price at 60 that could allow you to get some of those customers, or 75 or something like that? But then you have to be careful that if you set that price that you don't lose some of the people who are willing to pay 150 they now actually are paying the lower price. Right? So you have to create a fence. Uh, some reason for the folks who are willing to pay the 150 to not go back and pay the um, uh, seventy-five dollar, uh, uh, seventy-five dollar fee or uh, price, and, and what you do is obviously you need to offer some conditions that make it harder for people to switch their prices. Um, and then, of course, what happened here is this section represents a group of people who would have been willing to pay more than one hundred fifty dollars. So, if you look at it, if if we, for example, set the price to one hundred seventy-five. There are probably um, 25 people who would have paid that, but that 25 people are now included in the ones who are paying the 150. So you're not maximizing your contribution. So you can see why yield management is very important, where companies now are investing in, how do I set those prices? 
so that I could actually maximize my contribution. So you see the contribution is 150 minus 15 times the 50 people that actually will pay for this, right? 6,750. Well, let's just take a look at a, a, a variation, a modification in this. Where Now, what if we had two prices? We have a $100 price and a $200 price now. So we're going to use those two. So if the you still have, of course, um, some lost revenues in these categories, but that's all right, because what you're really attempting to do is to maximize. You really will not be able to have 20 different prices uh, and then try to capture it, because that's the only way to do it. Because then now you have to create 20 different conditions, set of conditions that would prevent customers from, or that would force the customer, the, 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 the customers into their different respective brackets. So that's why we talked about the whole idea of customer segmentation. You got to know who your customers are, what is it that they want, and use those factors to prevent them from going from one thing to the next. So for example, a leisure traveler who, who's backpacking really doesn't care about a nice um, a meal in, in business class, so they're not going to pay a $2,000 fare. But the business person who wants comfort, who wants luxury, will figure that this is part of, uh, this is what they deserve, is not going to want to pay the uh, $500 ticket. They're willing to pay the $2,000 ticket just for the extras. So, but you have to provide that traveler something that the person who's paying 150 bucks is not getting. So you have to be able to segment your customers. So as you look at this, um, we set one price um, $100 and then a price $200. So the folks who are 200 are going to, you have 30 people who will pay that $200 price and an extra 30 people who will pay that $100 price, okay? And now if you look at the contribution of those two groups, we have 100 minus 15 times 30 and then 200 minus 15 times 30. So now the contribution is $8,100, which is better than what we had before, which was only $6,000 uh, and something. But then we, ha we have to ensure that these customers here, um, and those customers here are two different customer segments. So each price range is supposed to represent a different customer segment. So if you think about a Canada and its pricing, for example, it has Tango, Tango Plus, uh, Leisure, uh, economy, um, sorry, executive, um, basically lowest, and then you have um, fully um, executive class. Well, executive lowest um, compared to full executive class. Full executive class could change any time they want, or how many times they want. But the full, ex but the executive lowest gives you an executive seat, but it does not allow you. It penalizes you if you try to change your date and so forth. So that's how you create defenses. Um, leisure have a lot more flexibility, almost as much flexibility as the folks who are in uh, the uh, full executive uh, class and so forth. And then you have Tango Plus, although now I think it's called Flex, they've changed the name of it and then Tango. So again, all of these have different conditions and that's what that actually creates the various fences that prevent people from migrating readily from one price category to the next, all right? And trying to determine what's the optimum mix of pricing is where the challenge comes in in terms of yield management. It's a very fascinating field. Finally, we could class, sort of classify, um, or we could create some categories of, of cases that reflect yield management. We could look at it in terms of price, whether or not the price is variable or fixed, and then the duration of the use of the item, whether or not it's uncertain, uh, it tends to be very predictable. So in a case where the price is fixed and the use, the, the duration of use is fixed, so for example, a movie, movie is two hours and the price is fixed. Um, however, you have here hotels uh, or airlines, uh, car rental companies, so we tend to know you want a car for two days, you want a car for three days, for five days, um, or one week, a hotel, same, you know, some amount of time, the cruise is a two-week cruise, uh, but the prices tend to be variable in, in a case like that. So you can offer some different prices for the airlines, different prices for the hotel rooms and so forth. When you get down here, you have fixed pricing, but the duration tends to be um, uh, uh, slightly uncertain. So people sit in a restaurant, 
They might actually, um, somebody, might, a group might sit there for three hours, a group might sit for one hour. Uh, in terms of golf, you might play two rounds of golf, some people might play one round of golf, uh, you're not exactly sure. And then in terms of uh, hospitals, the pricing and the uh, duration, well in that case continuing care, we don't know how long people are going to be there, particularly when they have major chronic illnesses. Uh, in a case like that, we're looking at this sort of category. All right. So to make yield management work, uh, one of the things that we must know is that um, there must be multiple pricing structures and it must appear logical to the customer. Why am I paying 150 versus 100 or 200 versus 150? That cannot be arbitrary because then people will need to make a choice as to which price they were going to pay. And then of course you got to be able to forecast the use and duration. Uh, uh, so that helps you actually classify customers and classify the options. And then you have to be able to predict changes in demands. What happened, um, oh, you know, from time to time, the factors that actually drive the demand pattern. So when um, holidays come up, we know that people are going to travel. Then, then of course, companies could jack up their fares uh, because you know that people will actually travel. People become a lot less price sensitive. In slow periods, people are a lot more price sensitive, but you could influence demand by um, you know, manipulating the prices appropriately and so forth. So that's why airlines give discounts during slow periods, but then of course double their fares in um, periods of high demand. So yield management, fascinating area that helps company max companies maximize the revenue, but ultimately it involves that balance between the capacity and the demand for that capacity.